days one through four. It took us four days to make the trip from Fort Benning, Georgia to Guam. This was America's most important base in the ongoing fight against China in the Pacific, and it had only recently become operational again after being absolutely savaged by long-range Chinese ballistic missile attacks. The Patriot batteries on the island had done a fair job, as did the SM-2s fired from many naval ships in the area, but enough got through to demolish the runway and many facilities. The base had basically been out of operation for most of the war, seriously putting the US forces at a disadvantage in the Pacific. But China's stockpile of long-range ballistic missiles had been used up. It only had nukes left, and nobody thought they were crazy enough to use them. I was part of the first wave of draftees into what had become the Third World War. In Europe, the tensions between Russia and NATO had finally erupted into all-out war. And China used the opportunity to invade Taiwan, believing the US would be too distracted to interfere. China had guessed wrong. From the first day of the invasion, US submarines were sinking Chinese ships. And so far, the nation's attempts to strangle Taiwan by cutting it off from the sea had failed. Initially, the Chinese Navy did establish a blockade, but that soon got smashed up by a stand-up, drag-down fight with the US Navy. Both sides had taken significant losses, but China had been forced to retreat to its shores. The People's Liberation Army forces, however, had made it to the island nation regardless, despite suffering catastrophic losses in the invasion. Now the PLA controlled the western half of the island, and Taiwan, the US, and its allies controlled the eastern half. The Chinese Navy was well in control of the strait, allowing it to resupply its forces. Me and my friend Aguiar had the good luck of getting sent to the same unit after our rush to basic training and infantrymen's course. We'd met in basic and had stuck together like glue since then. If I was going into a living hell in the Pacific, I was glad he was coming with me. Days 5 through 7. The newly repaired and expanded facilities on Guam were buzzing with military activity. The Navy Seabees had done an incredible job getting everything operational so fast after basically being leveled by tens of thousands of pounds of Chinese explosives. Now practically the entire island was a hive of military personnel and equipment. Just offshore sat a carrier strike group, finishing preparations for a return to the Taiwan theater. Pilot and plane losses were high, we just didn't have enough F-35s in either the Air Force or the Navy. Up against new generations of missiles and radars, fourth gen planes on both sides were getting swatted out of the air on a regular basis. That was changing though, and on one of the flight lines sat a row of shiny, brand new F-35s. Soon they'd be flown out to the carrier to reconstitute the ship's losses. There were also three squadrons of F-22s here, on their way to bases in the Philippines and Japan, where they could easily join the fight over Taiwan. Our fifth-gen planes were lethal, but so were China's J-20s. Luckily, they were few in number compared to the F-22s and F-35s, but China had used them wisely before running out targeting AWACS and aerial tankers that the US relied on so heavily for the fight over Taiwan. The losses of these special mission aircraft were devastating to the war effort. Aguiar and I sat around most of the time, typical hurry up and wait stuff. We saw some of the wounded being returned from Taiwan. The United States hadn't taken casualties like this since Vietnam and they were mounting. I didn't know if the US had been truly prepared for the cost of this war. Days 8 through 12. It was finally time for us to make the transit to Taiwan, because the eastern side of the island was in Allied hands and big mountains blocked long-range radar line of sight for China, it was relatively safe to land air cargo on the surviving airfields there. By now, the US, Australia, Japan, and Taiwan had enough air power to hold off any attempt to interdict air transports by China, but there was always the possibility of a surviving J-20 or two slipping through and blowing your C-5 galaxy out of the sky. Or at least that was the fear for those of us making the trip. Luckily, the J-20 hadn't been seen since the second month of combat. Approaching the island, the C-5 hit the deck, flying just a hundred feet over sea level. This was a precaution, and one I hoped was unnecessary. She rose briefly to bleed off airspeed and then performed a combat landing, meaning the pilot dropped several hundred feet in a few seconds and we were suddenly wheels to the deck. I barely managed to keep my lunch in. Plenty of guys with us, including Aguiar, didn't. We got our orders soon after landing. In the distance, you could hear the sound of artillery and aircraft screaming in the skies above us. The air war was still very much alive, with the US beating back Chinese fighters long enough to buy an hour or two of mission time for ground strike aircraft. We were being used to replenish casualties in regular units, and I was relieved to hear that. My worst fear was that we were being formed into a brand new company. At least now I'd be with veterans who knew what they were doing. Our unit was still at the front, preparing to be relieved. So once more, it was hurry up and wait. The sound of artillery would come and go, and we were told it was nothing like on the Eastern Theater against Russia. With the bulk of US air power dedicated to the Pacific, the war in the East had turned into a massive artillery duel. 
While NATO aircraft cleared the skies and destroyed air defenses, in Ukraine and the Baltics, they say the sound of artillery never stops. Days 13 to 15. We finally got to meet our new unit, and it wasn't an encouraging sight. The men looked tired, exhausted, and a lot of them were wounded, though not bad enough to get sent to a rear area hospital or home. Cuts and bruises from shrapnel or impacts on their body armor. I was grateful we got assigned armor. I heard that as more draftees were rounded up, the stockpiles of modern equipment were running out. We had plenty of rifles to spare, but things like night vision and body armor? They were expensive, and the US was starting to struggle to fully equip new troops. Night vision was critical. It was our biggest advantage. While many Chinese troops were equipped with NVGs, a lot weren't. For Russia, the situation was even worse. Both the Chinese and Russians tended to stick to defensive maneuvers at night, while the US would launch most of its offensives under the cover of darkness. Aguiar and I were introduced to our squad mates. With us two, it was now back up to full force. The two we were replacing had gotten caught in Chinese mortar fire. That was it, they didn't really say anything else. Death was just sort of taken as a given around here. Then we waited again. We trained and got briefed by our platoon on how the Chinese fight, the do's and don'ts, and other ins and outs of war, but our unit was taking some R&R &R in the rear, so we weren't due to return to the front anytime soon. From the look of the guys, they needed it. Days 16 to 20. It was weird being at war, mostly because I expected to actually be at war. I didn't expect to fly around the world just to sit around for a week or two. I managed a phone call back home, bandwidth was very limited, and the Chinese were always launching electronic attacks against US networks. So far, infrastructure networks had not been targeted. Both China and the US had an unspoken agreement that they would not destroy each other's infrastructure via electronic attacks. This could cause collapse of power grids or water delivery to major cities and kill thousands. It would be tantamount to a WMD attack on home soil, and both nations had avoided it so far. Everything else, including financial networks, were all fair game, and both sides waged a brutal electronic war with ripples that spread across cyberspace. My dad had been a veteran of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and told me what to expect. He left out the part about waiting so long to actually go to war. I knew it was stupid, but I was kind of eager for it. Sort of like when there's something you really dread coming up. I'd rather just get it over with and have it linger forever. My parents told me they loved me and to stay safe. On day 21, my war would start. Days 21 to 23. We just left OB Bravo, as the main staging area for US forces was known. Maybe an hour had gone by, down mostly empty roads through the large fields of Taiwan's east. Suddenly we were under Chinese attack. Chinese ground strike missiles rained down on our formation, obliterating three of our Humvees and one of our supply trucks, over a dozen people dead in the blink of an eye. It was our good luck a Taiwanese F-16 had been in the area spotting the stealthy drone that blew its cover by popping open its weapons bay and spitting out three missiles. 30 seconds later, the drone was a flaming wreckage as the quick-acting F-16 closed toward the drone and within range of targeting radar. This was a war of stealth, and both sides had invested heavily in the technology. The modern aerial battlefield was an incredibly deadly place, and stealth technology wouldn't make you invisible, but it did buy you a lot of time before you could be targeted. That gave aircraft precious minutes to carry out their mission. Suffering catastrophic losses in the air, the Chinese air forces had redirected their efforts toward quickly producing and launching stealthy drones. The strategy was working, too. Small stealthy drones were regularly penetrating past the US and Taiwanese radar pickets and combat air patrols to deadly consequences. After seeing to the wounded, our convoy set back on its course to the front. The entire company had just been fully reconstituted, and already we had a dozen dead and six wounded. Days 24 to 30. The front line was everywhere. It shifted back and forth, house by house, block by block, as the US and Taiwan fought off a Chinese land invasion in the cities. The Germans had called it Rattenkrieg, or Rat War, and it hadn't changed much in nearly a hundred years. At first, both sides brought modern technology to the fight. Urban drones and microwave sensors that could detect human movement through walls. Real 21st century hardware. But the war had chewed all that up in the first few months. Now it was dirty house-to-house -house fighting, with little tech involved. The US had brought the fanciest gadgets to the fight, given its 20-year history in close quarters battle. But while most of these had been destroyed or damaged in war, the lessons of 20 years of urban combat stuck around. The Chinese had no such comparable experience. As a matter of fact, they had no experience at all in modern combat, their last war having been fought in the late 70s against Vietnam. Both China and Vietnam claimed victory, but it was Chinese troops who found themselves retreating from strategic gains. Since then, they'd mostly just bullied fishing and oil vessels in the South China Sea. This inexperience cost the nation dearly. But China was a quick learner. Its troops performed significantly better than Russia's had in Ukraine. 
But there were complexities of modern combined arms war that the Chinese leadership had yet to learn. The US, on the other hand, was a veteran warfighter, and that veterancy showed up in the dramatically reduced casualties it took in comparison to its rival. During the day we defended whatever home we were cooped up in. We might have another few squads a house over, or we might just be half a platoon holding a single building surrounded by the enemy. The war had no real front line, measured less in kilometers than in city blocks. By night, we attacked, taking advantage of the fact that we still had more and better night vision than the Chinese. I don't know what I thought war was going to be, but it wasn't this. I pictured the same big open battlefields of World War II, like every other recruit in this war. Not fighting and living like city rats in extremely close quarters. Aguiar and I had learned to fall asleep to the sound of an M240 Bravo hammering away at some distant target. Days 31 to 35. I thought I'd take longer to get used to the violence, but I guess when it's kill or be killed your mind can be pretty elastic. I felt afraid of what would happen when I snapped somewhere home far away from the hectic atmosphere of this place. Aguiar did his best to cheer me up. He always liked telling jokes and funny stories, and somehow he found the joy to crack a few funny jokes when the rest of us needed it most. I think we all needed that from him, though none of us would admit it. We took a house the day before yesterday and found a Taiwanese family inside. The Chinese who'd taken the home before us had locked them away in the back rooms, trying to keep them out of the line of fire. They'd even supplied them with food and water. Despite the fact that they were trying to kill us, I could at least respect them for not treating civilians like chattel. Of course, I heard different stories from other parts of the front, so it was hard to know how well these civilians were faring under the Chinese occupation. The divide between China and Taiwan was political, not racial or religious, so treatment of captured civilians had generally been fair, at least for as long as Western media still had access to the conflict. And that had been months ago. Who knows what happened since? War makes us all ugly. Days 36 to 40. Something big was shaping up. I'd only been on the front for two and a half weeks, but I already had a good sense for the pulse of things. Jesus, was it really just two and a half weeks? Felt like months. We lost another guy from our squad to a sniper. So far, we'd given far better than we'd gotten, but the fight was still a slow, knockdown, drag out fight for individual buildings. Air support was largely non existent. In an age of extremely capable man pads, nobody could fly aircraft near the front. Drones were frequently used for both suicide attacks and for intelligence gathering or targeting, but even those were having great difficulty. Both sides were filling the air with electronic noise, jamming communications between drones and their operators. We'd been using switchblade suicide drones pretty effectively, and even had some 600s, the type with the anti-tank payload. They were good at dropping the ceiling on people too, but the Chinese had their own, and that's how one of our other squads had lost two guys. Aguiar's got a new joke he's been telling everyone. What did the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans do when they met? They waved. It's so bad, I want to throw them out of cover and straight into enemy fire. Days 41 through 46. We got relieved for three days and pulled back to one of our forward staging areas in the suburbs of the city. It wasn't like Guam or even being back at Obi Bravo on the coast, but it was significantly safer. The small base had been set up in an industrial park with barbed wire and lookout towers to guard the perimeter. We'd gotten chewed up in the three weeks of fighting, suffering somewhere around 40% casualties. Of those, a third were KIA. A handful were lightly wounded and would return with us back to fighting in three days. For the rest, we got replenishment, though these were not draftees. They were veterans from other units that had suffered too many casualties to remain cohesive. Their platoons and companies existed now only on paper. Sergeant Kristoff had been our squad leader since we got to the front, and had come to be a sort of mentor figure, exactly what a good squad leader should be. He told us that the fact that we were getting replenished with veteran troops meant we were about to get thrown into the mix in a real bad way. He knew what he was talking about. He'd been here since month two of the war, when US ground forces had arrived to reinforce the Taiwanese defense. It had been an extremely unpopular decision back home, but commitment of ground combat power was seen as critical to keeping Taiwan free and reclaiming the island. So Sergeant Chris would end up being completely right, as usual. Days 47 to 52. We managed to get a few extra days in the rear, which was a relief. I even got to call back home. I can't believe it'd been a month since I joined the fighting. I already felt like I'd been at war for years. My dad seemed to understand how I felt. He didn't ask many questions and encouraged my mother to do the same. Aguiar's family wasn't military the way mine was, and both he and his parents ended up weeping on the phone. There's no shame in it though, we were way past that point. I also got to watch some news coverage of the fighting from back home. They were calling it the heaviest fighting the United States had seen since World War II, and they were right. At sea, we were winning at a cost. The Chinese ballistic missile force devastated the US Pacific Navy, but inevitably the US won the seas. 
that meant putting vessels on the Straits of Malacca to blockade Chinese trade. Cruise missile strikes into northern China had severed the oil pipeline between itself and Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula. Now the oil transfer was reduced to a trickle from a few pipelines in the far west of the nation all leading into Russia. A lot of these pipes were underground, making them difficult to hit. Instead, the US had sent B-2 stealth bombers through neutral Kazakhstan to strike at oil refinery facilities in the south of Russia. China had been furious about the attacks, blaming Russia for being caught so off guard. That was a raid that was unlikely to repeat itself as a dense SAM network was quickly deployed to the area, but it had all but crippled Russia's ability to export oil to China. And that was China's Achilles heel, its inability to protect its oil imports. There was talk that that war would be over in weeks as the Chinese economy tanked. Days 53 to 56. Our extended vacation was courtesy of an entire delay in the general logistics of the pending operation we were to take part in. Now we were on the way back to the front, but in armored vehicles. Then it was hurry up and wait all over again. Finally, we got briefed on the plan. We were going to thrust deep into the city's financial sector, the area full of high-rises. Chinese forces had made it a base of operations and ran their defensive lines north and south of there. It was an incredibly bold attack, given it was the most heavily defended stretch of the front, and the high-rise buildings would be a nightmare to wrestle away from the Chinese. But if we could pierce the heart of their defense, it would split their lines in two and force them to withdraw or be overwhelmed. There were other parts of the plan we weren't privy to, of course, just in case we were captured. Finally, day 57, we cranked our vehicles to life and made the push to the center of the city. Days 57 to 62. The fighting was immediately fierce. Anti-tank guided missiles rained down on us from above, exactly as expected. But we weren't completely defenseless. Our vehicles had all been equipped with Israeli-made trophy systems, which used explosive projectiles to intercept incoming missiles. We also had a laser countermeasure that burned out the seeker in a missile. They both worked great, but eventually Trophy would run out of countermeasures and laser countermeasures weren't effective all the time. Plus, we were largely being fired at from above, so even if a missile seeker was damaged it still had a high probability of hitting something. Air power made all the difference. Apaches were supporting our attack and eliminating enemy machine gun and rocket teams as they popped up in the high rises above us. Small, nimble little birds, two-seater helicopters, armed with machine guns and rocket pods, were even more useful though darting in between buildings and nimbly responding to threats. They fared better than the Apaches, which were taking significant casualties to manpads. But the enemy had to be cleared out of each building the old-fashioned way, and the fight for the heart of the city turned into a grudge match as US troops slowly climbed high-rises floor by floor. The assault was ceaseless. As we retreated down a few floors to catch some sleep, other squads kept pushing up. The US had committed significant manpower to the risky operation and was using constant pressure to exhaust the Chinese defenders. Days 63 to 65. We'd done it, albeit at a significant cost. The last Chinese command post had surrendered after eight days of fierce fighting. US armor had struck deep into the enemy rear, bypassing the dense urban terrain, and cut off resupply lines into the city. The US and Taiwanese air forces had fended off Chinese air attacks attempting to destroy the armored thrust. Casualties were high all around, but the joint US-Taiwan operation had succeeded. Cut off from resupply, the Chinese in the urban center had surrendered as the situation became hopeless for them. That meant the entire Chinese line on the southern tip of the island was split in two, and Taiwanese maneuver forces were quickly exploiting the gap and flanking both sides of the defensive line. Our squad celebrated by relaxing on a helipad at the very top of the skyscraper we just fought and bled over floor by floor for a week. The sun was setting. And if it wasn't for the sounds of distant battle and the roar of the military jet engines overhead, it would have been a beautiful sight. Days 66 to 70. We spent four days going over the former Chinese positions in the building, taking everything apart with a fine tooth comb, and looking for any intelligence that might have been left behind. They destroyed most of their documents and computers when defeat became inevitable. But we managed to secure a stash of shredded documents which the intelligence guys had to sit down and spend an entire day taping back together. It was such maddening work that almost all of us preferred to be back on the streets below fighting for our lives. Aguiar cracked the jokes the entire time, at least keeping us entertained. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, there was a massive roar and a bright flash of light. I felt myself get thrown a dozen feet across the wide open former office space, crashing into desks that had been piled on top of each other in makeshift barricades. For the next minute, I struggled to breathe and see clearly through cloudy vision. I remember someone calling for a medic. Then I passed out. When I came to, I found myself on a stretcher in one of the lower levels, a large dining room that had been cleared out and turned into a field hospital. The Chinese drone had slipped through the air defense net, 
hugging the buildings to stay out of the line of sight of radar, our thermal signature would have been easy to spot through the giant glass windows of the office tower, and one missile later half the squad was dead. Aguiar was next to me when I woke up, as usual he dodged death without a scratch, but he wasn't telling jokes anymore. Days 71 through 74. I got held under observation for a few days. There wasn't much physically wrong with me, but the doctor said I suffered a concussion and would need to be monitored. My helmet and body armor saved me from the worst. I can't say the same for my squad, though. There was me, Aguiar, Sergeant Chris, a brand new draftee from Kentucky named Stevens, and the medic that had been attached to us. The rest of the squad were either in pieces or seriously injured. Our company was essentially dissolved, and we got absorbed into a different company altogether. Yet another US military unit that existed only on paper. If anyone had thought this war would be easy, they were receiving a rather rude surprise. Days 75 to 79. The war had been a grind, and now suddenly it turned into a sprint. Chinese forces were in retreat across the entire city, trying to consolidate their lines in the suburbs. The US armored force at the rear was there to greet them, but getting absolutely hammered by fierce Chinese counterattacks from the west, trying to neutralize it before it did its work on the retreating Chinese in the city. Our job was to chase them, pushing them through the city and straight into the waiting arms of Bradley's, Abrams, and Taiwanese M60s, if they could survive the onslaught from the west. Sergeant Chris, Stevens, our medic, Aguiar, and I all got assigned to a brand new platoon, itself a Frankensteinian creation from other random units that got thrown together. The war was moving too fast for the US to wait for full reconstitution, and with fighting in Europe there was no telling when there might be manpower to make a unit whole again. Every week more US units began to exist only on paper. Days 80 to 85. We were winning, at least this part of the war, and that felt good after months of barely nudging each other's lines. China's economic troubles were catching up with it, and its military was suffering for it. The momentum was slowly shifting in our favor. Stephen saved my life as we pushed the Chinese deeper into the suburbs. Someone had tossed a grenade out a house window right at my feet. In a split second, Stevens had picked it up and chucked it back. It exploded right outside the house, showering it with shrapnel. Stevens had to drag me down to the ground because I was dumbfounded and in shock from seeing the grenade land at my feet. He'd been with us, what, two weeks, three weeks? Was it a month? Time seemed to drag on here. I felt like I'd been here for years and was shocked to discover I hadn't even been on the island three months. Yet, I was a full-blown combat veteran with two months of urban door-to-door -door fighting experience. I remember my first job out of high school at a donut shop. I was barely confident enough to use the oversized fryers after three months. Days 86 to 90. I'm up, they see me, I'm down, I thought to myself. That had been my mantra for the last week straight. The terrain here was giving out to large fields as we neared the very outskirts of the city. There wasn't much to hide behind, so you ran in short bursts. Never long enough for someone to get a good beat on you. Then you hit the ground and rolled over left or right, that way they wouldn't pick you off when you stood back up. While down on the ground, you put out suppressing fire for your buddy who's moving up. I heard Aguiar murmuring it under his breath as he crashed down to the ground near me. I'm up, they see me, I'm down. Despite myself, I couldn't help but laugh as I dragged myself up and rushed forward. I'd seen what war was, nice and up close. Not what they put on the TV screen. I think without Aguiar around, I would have lost my marbles by now. US armor got absolutely hammered, but held the line long enough to tear into the retreating Chinese forces. It had been apocalyptic, I'd been told, with incredible losses on the Chinese side. We'd taken hundreds of prisoners from surrenders alone. The US Air Force even pushed back the Chinese air defense umbrella, meaning we could put our JTAC guy to work calling in air support. In my three months of the war, I'd yet to experience the use of close air support, and I immediately regretted that we hadn't had it always available. It was like a magic button you pressed and poof, your enemies disappeared under a withering storm of napalm, high explosives, and 30mm cannon fire. Days 91-95 to 95. The Chinese tried to throw us back in a brutal three-day counterattack. We dug ourselves three feet in the dirt and created slit trenches to weather the incredible artillery being lobbed at us. The tube artillery was the best artillery to get shelled by, because you could hear the whistle of incoming from the lower velocity rounds. It still beat the rocket artillery. Dozens of rockets all impacting at once, before infantry could get to cover of trenches. That had been the entire point of their development, and it worked with deadly efficiency. Both air forces had thrown each other's air defense zones back away from the front, with China hurling what must have been the last of its reserves of modern fighters into the fight. Jets fell from the sky in the dozens as both sides went to work on each other. Stealth fighters are nice, but the fighting quickly turned into a knife fight where F-35s and even F-22s could be identified and targeted by weapon radar. What that meant for us, though, is that the enemy finally had a chance to use its own close air support. 
something I hope to never experience again. Our side retaliated, and losses of close air support aircraft were high for both sides. Artillery ruled the battlefield once more, and both sides traded deadly salvos. In between the salvos, though, Chinese infantry would attack, supported by its armor. Abrams was the superior killer here. China's Type 99s were formidable monsters, but US Abrams could shoot more accurately at longer ranges, and exchanges at close range proved China still had a bit to learn about tank armor. However, Taiwan's M60s were easy prey for even the older Chinese models. On the second day of the assault, the Chinese ran straight into a minefield that had been laid the night before by US aircraft. The Gator mine system consists of a cluster munition filled with mines instead of explosives. With one pass, each aircraft could lay out a 200 meter by 650 meter swath of mined territory, and this even included anti-tank mines. It almost felt like cheating, to be honest, but it blunted their attack significantly. I was concerned about when it'd be our turn to cross that field, but Sergeant Chris told me the mines detonate themselves after a set time. Days 96 to 97. We had two entire days of peace on the front. I remember reading about it in accounts of the First World War. After the chaos of the battle for days on end, it would suddenly go eerily quiet. This was like that, and was only broken when we got orders to move forward. The Chinese had retreated. Picking up my rifle and rucksack, I climbed out of the hole I'd been living in for days and began to cross the fields ahead of us. The sun was shining, but not enough to be hot, and we had a nice breeze coming in from the coast. The grass was tall and green, real soft as it brushed up against your legs. If it wasn't for the sight and smell of smoldering wrecks and corpses, it would have been a fine hike. Days 98 through 100. In the numbness of the war, Aguiar is one of those rare people that brings life back to the lifeless. He'd crack a joke here or there almost tactically as if he knew just what to say and who needed to hear it for a quick uplifting chuckle. He reminded us every day of the other side of life, what existed out there, away from here. I think that's why it hit us all so hard when he died. It had been a sniper, hiding out in one of the small houses that dotted the countryside. Good clean shot from at least 200 meters away. I was grateful for that. He hit the ground but was gone before impact. No screaming in pain, no cries of terror, just sleep. I was grateful for that too. One of our Abrams put a round through the house, then for good measure we sprayed it with 50 caliber fire. When they sent us to look for remains, we found the shooter, well, enough of him to know it had been some old guy dressed in civilian clothing. Not all the Taiwanese opposed reunification, some had been calling for it for years, sometimes violently. A lot had been former PLA soldiers who made the move to the island decades ago. Some of those soldiers had been good shots. We were going to get rotated to the rear in another day or two for some light rest and reconstitution. I know I'd have to call his mother then. It was only right that she heard it from me first, rather than a soldier in dress uniform knocking on her door. At least we were winning. This is what winning feels like. Now go watch I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War, or click this other video instead.